fail to answer this fundamental question, and we're in serious trouble. Our lives, our well-being, depend on getting it right. Perhaps we underestimate, though, just how hard that can be. It's not simply a feat of memory. You have to know how to tell the time in the first place. Today's gospel offers two very different ways of telling the time. The first dates events according to the politics of Imperial Rome and its client rulers. It's the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar's reign when this princeling or that magistrate governs a given territory of the empire. To tell the time this way asserts the emperor's authority over his subjects, identifies them as those subjects, makes periodic demands on them, on their wallets. We can perhaps think of this as a political clock. Perhaps it has a modern counterpart in summer sales, Black Friday, and the number of shopping days to Christmas. Well, the second calendar in our gospel follows immediately on the first. It's the pontificate of Annas and Caiaphas when they are high priests in the Jerusalem temple. This way of telling the time centers on worship of God according to the Mosaic covenant. It asserts God's sovereignty over his chosen people, speaks of that continuing identity, relativizes the claims of a Roman emperor or any other earthly ruler, directs Israel to hope, hope despite everything, in God's sure promises. This we could think of as our religious clock, and now, in the fullness of that time, God's word comes to John in the wilderness. The quotation from Isaiah makes clear that John signals the imminent arrival of God's anointed king, the one who will uphold justice and champion the poor. Barak, in our first reading, imagines this as a startling makeover for Jerusalem. Off will come the rags of poverty, on will go the sumptuous dress of a princess, the fine cloak and jeweled tiara. God will give the city a new name, peace of righteousness and glory of godliness, where God's all-powerful word is creative of what it speaks. Surely then we are about to see God's long-awaited triumph. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. There's a hard question first as to how these two clocks relate to one another. A difficulty, you might say, in synchronizing watches. Yes, God will triumph in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. His birth, life, death, and resurrection will inaugurate God's eternal kingdom. But the full triumph still lies in the future. We are directed towards what St. Paul in our second reading calls the day of Christ. That future, whether near or far off, is to shape our present goals and priorities. And there's another issue. It's very easy to rule our present lives according to some version of the political clock, secular time, and to neglect the religious clock. It's one thing to remember that this is 2021 rather than, say, 1974, but something more important to know that it is, properly speaking, the year of our Lord, 2021. 
We count the years from the birth of Christ to acknowledge his reign, but that acknowledgement has to be carried through in how we use our time, how we prepare to meet our King. To redress this possible imbalance, the church has developed over the centuries its own third clock, the liturgical clock or calendar, with its days of feasting and fasting, its penitential season of Lent, and of course, this present season of Advent. Advent is much more than a numerical countdown to Christmas, so many doors to be opened on the calendar. It's a rich liturgical sequence of readings, chants, antiphons, and prayers that together sensitize us to the underlying religious clock ready us for the drama of Christmas, when God takes on our weakness in order to be our savior. What time is it then? Well, above all, Advent reminds us that it's time to repent of sin. As John the Baptist called the Jewish people of his day to repentance, the door to be opened is the door to the heart the door which allows God's forgiveness to enter in and transform us in the image of his beloved son. And finally, we may think that in telling us the time, Advent also tells us where we are. It can't be accidental that God calls to John in the wilderness, that John is heard as the prophetic voice of one crying in the wilderness. This, of course, is not the wilderness painted by romantic artists, a place of noble grandeur, a prelapsarian nature. Nor is it the great outdoors enjoyed by the modern hiker with maps and compass or GPS. It's rather a bewildering place. Travel across the rocky terrain without waymarks is arduous. It's a parched land of arid, desolate places where life is precarious. Only God can make this desert bloom, provide food and water for his people, build a highway on which that people can safely cross to his holy city. So maybe we're called to recognize that this is where we are, or at least where we would be if it were not for God's goodness, God's grace. And by knowing where we are, we can find the right way forward, find our way to the Lord Jesus Christ, the child in the manger who is the way, the truth, and the life.